Thanks for, thanks for bearing with me through that. That was quite painful. Okay, so today I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey from our humble JavaScript beginnings to some of the large-scale web applications that we're seeing around today. So building large-scale web applications is not an easy task. They very quickly become these brittle, tangled messes of hard to read, hard to understand, hard to test, and hard to change code. So today I'm going to show some very key uh, architectural concepts, some simple architectural concepts that you can use in your apps to make them able to readily accept change, to be scalable. And I'm going to do this using Backbone.js as an example, although a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about are totally not specific to Backbone itself. So if you hate Backbone, there will be something in it for you. But first, just I promise it'll be super quick. Who am I? I'm Amy. I work for a company called Green Button down in Wellington. And what Green Button does is we uh, take high-performance computing workloads and we burst them out into the cloud. And not just one cloud, uh, all the clouds, any cloud. It's quite cool. I, re I really like it. Um, so I spend most of my days uh, writing C-sharp code, but I have a bit of a love affair with JavaScript. And one of the things that I love about JavaScript has been watching what it's done for our experiences on the web. We've come a long way from the days of static HTML to the days where we were pretty bored by static HTML and we demanded much richer web experiences. We've seen the introduction of libraries like jQuery and Zepto, these libraries, these DOM abstraction libraries. And what they've done is allowed, it, allowed us to create much richer web experiences with great ease. So I think it's fair to say that we've evolved to a state that I like to call jQuery soup. So we've all seen it, and we've probably, if we're honest with each other, we've probably all contributed to a code base like this from time to time. These things happen. But I think the very thing that these libraries, these DOM abstraction libraries, are so good at, querying the DOM, is in fact partly responsible for some of the soupy code that we see. So when a library is really good at doing something, you tend to want to do it all the time, right? And these libraries, they're good at querying things, namely the DOM. So it's tempting to start storing all of our application state in the DOM and then using these libraries to start grabbing it out and doing all sorts of things with them. And very quickly, they become these tangled, hard to understand, spread out code bases. So as the complexity of our application grows, and the amount of state that we have to keep track of also grows, so does this code base, this spaghetti, soupy code base. We soon start to realize that the way we've built our app doesn't accept change over time. It's not a scalable uh, design. So we need to add some structure to our app, right? And I think a lot of the JavaScript community realized this at very similar times. And we've seen this birth of libraries and frameworks to help us better structure our JavaScript applications. And a lot of these libraries and frameworks, they fall under this family of patterns, MV star, model view something, whatever. And what, the, what model, view, uh, model view star does is it tries to separate your model concerns, your data concerns, from what you're doing with your view. So you might have heard of some of these things before, these patterns. So there's model view controller, there's model view presenter, model view view model. Do you know what? It actually doesn't really matter. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't care. You should care what this other thing is. All I'm trying to say is that these things have two things in common. The first is that everybody loves arguing about which one's the best, and the second is that they're all trying to achieve a separation of concerns between our data and our views. And it's this very fact alone that helps, these, helps you bring structure to your jQuery soup, your soupy JavaScript. So I mentioned that there are libraries and there are frameworks, and sometimes it can feel like a bit of an unnecessary street fight between the two. Developers love arguing. So I thought I'd just briefly cover off what the differences are between a framework and a library. So frameworks, right, they, they generally try and be all-encompassing. They're these, these huge beasts that have a my way or the highway mentality. And you're guided with a very heady, heavy hand about what the author of the framework thought was um, more appropriate. And in a lot of ways, this can be really good because it brings you an instant productivity, right? Somebody's told you how to structure your code. Somebody's told you what the best practices are, and you followed that, and you were instantly productive. But this is at the cost of freedom. You don't have a lot of choice uh, about 
stepping outside of, outside of that box. They're prescript prescriptive and they can sometimes be restrictive. So if you contrast that to, frame, uh, to libraries, sorry, libraries don't try and do everything for you. They generally just pick one or two things and then try and do that really, really well. And they leave a lot of the structure, the stuff that goes around the call into the library, they leave that up to you. So it gives you a lot of freedom and choice. So I've got a bit of a list here of some of the popular JavaScript uh, frameworks and libraries that help you bring structure into your application using one of these MVSTAR uh, patterns. And next to it, I've got the star count uh, on GitHub, which kind of is an indication of relative uh, popularity, I guess. And you can see here that Backbone has quite a huge following. So today, I'm going to take you through some of these concepts and more concepts to help you uh, better structure your application. And I'm going to use Backbone as my example. So what is Backbone? Backbone is a library that can, be, can fit under the MVSTAR uh, uh, umbrella. Um, model view controller is what they claim it to be. We could talk about that later if you like. Um, so it's really small. It's ridiculously small. The minified production version is 6.3K. It's teeny tiny. It's so small that you could sit down and read all of the code before you even write a line of backbone. And that's pretty cool. So, okay, so it brings to the table a few things. It gives you models. So models are the heart of any JavaScript application. They give you a way to contain your data and a lot of the uh, functions that sit around your data, things like security, validation, uh, computed properties maybe. So you're going to extend the backbone model with your domain-specific models. And then you're going to use a view, a backbone view. And this is a way to organize uh, your user interface into logical small views. And the general idea here is the views are backed by a model and they describe a way for you to render a small piece of the UI, perhaps when that model changes or some other interesting events happen. So if the key thing that Backbone gives you are models and views, then events are like the glue, the thing that kind of binds them together. So you can use events for connecting the two. For example, if the model, change, if the model changes, you might raise an event to say, I've changed, and the view goes, oh, you've changed, I'm going to re-render my small part of the UI. And the last thing that Backbone gives you is routers. And I'm not really going to talk about routers too much today, but I did want to mention them. It's just a quick way for you to provide linkable URLs so that your users can hop deep within your application. OK, so if you've found yourself swimming through this jQuery soup we were talking about, then pulling in a library like Backbone is an awesome first step to start adding structure to your code. So here I've got an example, an example where a state about an animal is being stored in the DOM. And I've got a function which is associated with that, with that animal, this thing, that's spread out somewhere else and has to use jQuery to query into the DOM to grab that state. If I refactor this with Backbone, I can create a model, an animal model, something that has meaning, put that say hello function inside of it. Uh, and then I'm only able to, to say hello. I ne only need to query inside the model. I only need to ask myself what my state is. Backbone views. I don't really want you to worry too much about the detail here. So the views in Backbone, they're backed by a model. They're, they're rendering a small piece of the UI. And then when an event is raised to say that the model has changed, we're going to re-render that small portion of the view. So the key thing here is that what Backbone is doing is it's giving you a way to have small, focused, and encapsulated parts of your JavaScript application. And that's extremely important to giving structure. Backbone kind of feels a little bit like Lego. So I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I used to freaking love playing with Lego. It was awesome. I'd spell out all my toys, all my Lego, all over the floor, and I'd just go crazy. I'd create all sorts of awesome and amazing things, and I just felt like I had ultimate creativity and ultimate control. And, and that's what Backbone is a little bit like, at least initially. Your creation is awesome until your boss comes in and he says, if you could just add that new feature, that'd be great. And you're like, my Lego spaceship doesn't take new features. It's built like this, and this is the only way that it's going to work. And if you wanted that new feature, you probably should have told me a little while ago. Well, this is a little bit like building software in a nutshell, right? Really, do we know how things are going to turn out? The only thing that we know for sure is that things are going to change. So we should be building our code in a way that will accept change. So all Backbone is doing is giving you a set of building blocks to start helping you into a world of better structured JavaScript, easier to test JavaScript, and easier to read JavaScript. 
What it doesn't do is give you a blueprint on how to structure your application beyond this. So we've reached a point now where we've got 1,000 views, 1,000 models, all of these events being raised everywhere, and I can't make a change, because if I do, it's going to break something over here, and I've got no idea what's going on. Is this sounding familiar? That awful spaghetti code, that unmaintainable mess, this code base that we can't change, it's over time we've started to realize that our code base is not built in a way that will readily accept change. Okay, so I've just been selling these MV star patterns as like the solution to all of our problems. Wasn't it supposed to fix all of that? Wasn't it supposed to allow me to move on with our, li our, our lives? So why are our eyes still bleeding? Well, I already told you the answer to this. These MV, MV star are presentation patterns. That's all they are. All they are doing is describing a way for you to better structure the interaction between your data and your views, and that's it. It doesn't give us any hints about a larger application structure beyond this. It doesn't tell us how to build our app in a way that will readily accept change. Okay, so how do we unsuck our backbone? Can we build large-scale JavaScript applications in backbone without wanting to, to stab our eyes out at the end? So I mentioned before that I'm a C-sharp developer, and I've spent a lot of my time building desktop applications and things like WinForms, WPF, and Silverlight. And if there's one thing that this experience has taught me, other than that Silverlight is rubbish, <laughs> is, that, is that there are a set of patterns that you can use to structure your application in a way that will readily accept change. So this is a composite event-driven architecture, and what I'm going to do is just take you through some of the key concepts of building your app in a composite manner. So Walter actually had this quote in his, uh, in his presentation, and it's a guy, Justin Meyer, who's an author of another popular uh, JavaScript MVC library, and he said that if we want to build large-scale apps, JavaScript apps, we shouldn't. We should just stop. We should build small apps, and then bring those small apps together and compose them at the end to make a larger application. So the first thing that we need to do to be able to readily accept change into our application is we need to round up all of those models and views that are kind of spread out everywhere and create order from the chaos, contain them within a module. A module is a thing that's a, a discrete area of functionality that belongs together. So, if we've already reached the point of no return, and it's very difficult for us to start spotting uh, what modules could be, I thought we'd just take a quick look at something like Google+. Okay, so this is the piece of Google+, where you can share to the Google+, timeline. This conceptually is a module. This does something useful. The thing that displays the timeline, this is also conceptually a module. In fact, these things could probably be broken down into sub-modules if you wanted to go that far. Pretty much everything on this page is a module. I, I don't want to imply that modules have to have some kind of widget type thing, but it's just the easiest way to explain it, I guess. So, so modules can definitely have no UI piece. You can start building modules that contain functionality that doesn't actually display a view and isn't a widget. That's totally awesome if you do that. So modules, they are a small piece of discrete functionality which will work on its own. Modules need to be decoupled from each other. And a sign that you're loosely coupled is that you can pull that module out of your application and nothing breaks. The only thing that disappears is the, the functionality that that module brought to the table in the first place. Modules should always ask. They should never take. When you're taking from somebody, you're expecting that you're going to get something back, right? So that kind of implies a dependence. So if you're asking, you're not necessarily expecting that you're going to get that thing. So it's a nice kind of mentality to have. Ask, but don't always expect. Don't be dependent on having some results from somebody. And above all, sticking things into modules is an awesome way to, start stop, to stop polluting the global scope. It's a neat way to keep things nice and contained. So a change to the, to the post module doesn't impact the feed module. And if I can put the post module on a new page, it should definitely be able to still work in its own right. So presentation patterns, they still play a part. So remember the stellar celebrated MV star patterns that we were talking about earlier? So rather than our models and our views being spread out everywhere, we've contained them within this module. 
There doesn't necessarily need to be a one-to-one -one mapping here. You can have a few modules and a few views inside a few models and a few views inside one module. We need to find the right level of grouping. So we don't want to have heaps of things to get heaps of uh, models and views together. We don't want them to become so big that our, mod our modules themselves are a bit of a behemoth and hard to manage, but they need to be useful in their own right. Okay, so now we've grouped everything into these modules. And they're kind of just floating around, doing their own little thing, working nicely in their own little sandbox. How do we get them to start playing together and start playing nice together? How do they work together? Well, they could self-organize. They could all start chatting away, raising events, publishing events, subscribing to events, working together for a common goal. But this creates dependence. If one of the modules goes down, the impact to the larger community of modules is actually quite large. You end up with a tangled web of events, like the backbone soup and the jQuery soup that we were talking about. It would be an eventing soup. So I just want to think about how, how the airport works, right? And what would happen if planes decided when they were going to take off and when they were going to land? If they could come and go when they liked, what would happen? I think we'd need a constant fleet of fire trucks and ambulance officers at the end of the runway, because it would just be madness. It'd be, it'd be a mess. I don't even want to think about it. But thankfully, this is not how the airport works. There's an air traffic control that can give structure to the airport. A centralized controller is, ki is key to the airport's success. All the planes communicate with this mediating source. They ask for permission to touch down and to take off. And in this way, chaos is averted. So we don't really have uh, an air traffic controller dude yet in our, in our application. So we're going to introduce something that can represent some of the functions of an air traffic control-esque thing. OK, so now we might have all of our events, all of the communication between modules being routed via this one central source, a mediated source. All of the modules are now publishing and subscribing to events via this one guy. Now, I'm definitely not trying to imply that all of your events need to go via one thing. I'm just trying to say that conceptually they belong together. You might have many of these event mediator-esque things which are, are responsible for the publish and, and subscribe of events, but they're all concept they all conceptually belong in this rough area of our application. So we've got the beginnings of an application design button here, right? We've got this application object that's responsible for composing our module's behaviors. So what else belongs here? So in terms of composite application design, I think of this object as kind of like the root, the hub, the hub of composition. And it's the starting point and the ending point of our application. And there's four main things that this object should be responsible for. So that's the startup of our application, any eventing that's taking place, managing modules life cycles, and the placement of views. So let's take a look at startup. So this is, this is your opportunity to rev yourself up and get ready for some of the things that your app's gonna do. You're gonna take care of any of the initial global setup that you need. You're gonna bootstrap your application. Do we have any configuration values that we need to load in? Do we need to load in any asynchronous modules? It might even be as simple as starting the backbone history API. So eventing, so this is like, do I have permission to do something, or can somebody do something for me? So within the application object, we're going to house within it one or many communication mediators. And our modules are going to communicate via this using publish and subscribe, a fire and forget mentality. So it's not uh, the, de the only decoupling tool that you can use to achieve decoupling between your modules, but it's a really easy way to achieve decoupling, and it's I think a lot of us uh, resonate really well with. It allows, by putting this inside this application object, it allows us to control the composition of complex behaviors that, uh, that occur between modules. So the next thing is life cycle. When is it safe for a module to start? And the only thing that can control this is something that knows a lot about what's going on in the application, this, this controlling source. So when a module should start, when is it safe for it to stop? And the last thing that this application object should do is control the placement, the placement of our views. 
So we've got all of these modules which contain views and they're all competing against each other to display something on the screen. And they can't all do that because it would just look awful and wouldn't make any sense. So we need something to decide who's got their views on the screen at any given time, when do they need to be removed, all of those kinds of things. So each of these functions, they're housed within this application object thing. Yes, they're housed there. But I'm not trying to imply that all of these functions just kind of loosely fit all of the spaghetti code inside this application object. Each of these functions deserve their own level of encapsulation. Okay, so we've now we've successfully rounded up all of our models and views and we've put them into these well-focused, well-contained modules. Our modules are communicating via a, a fire and forget uh, mechanism, publish and subscribe, reducing the complexity of uh, managing behaviors between modules. And we finally, we have this unifying application object that's responsible for the composition of our module's behaviors and the presentation of its views. So applications that are built like this are flexible enough to, uh, to accept change. And this is because you can make a change to one small part that does one small job, and it doesn't leak out everywhere. You can remove a module and nothing will break. You can, you can change the way um, the internal workings of a module uh, behaves and nothing will break. In, in the sense of the larger application. So, can we build backbone applications like this? Well, we're all programmers, we can totally do that. We could write our own code to implement some of the structures that I've just talked about, or you could use a library to help you achieve these. And so one of the libraries that I like to use to help me achieve a scalable design is, is Marionette.js. So Marionette is a library, it's a set of extensions to, uh, to Backbone, and it allows us to build our app in a composite and an event-driven way. It's written by Derek Bailey, and he's a pretty prolific blogger on, on all Backbone topics. In terms of size, it's about 14K. So to put that into perspective, that's about half the size of jQuery and about double the size of Backbone. So personally, I think that it adds enough value to structuring my application and reducing boilerplate code that I think it's worth bringing it along for the ride. So Marionette can be split into two parts. The first is a set of extensions to the MVStar uh, backbone views that I was talking about before. And the second is a set of extensions which help, which help us build our application in a composite and event-driven manner. So I'm just briefly going to cover some of the, the MVStar extensions, the view extensions that Marionette offer, offers us. So one of the downfalls of, of backbone views is the amount of plumbing code that you have to write. I don't know how many times you have to write the same bloody render method. 99% of the time they do exactly the same thing. So Marionette actually started out as a way to reduce this boilerplate code, this noise, and start achieving some you know, proper results. So there's the things that I'm going to cover today, there's a few more than this, but I'm just going to pick three. So I'm going to cover an item view, a collection view, and a layout. So an item view, so a Marionette item view is, uh, is designed to render a single item. So normally this would be a backbone model, but it could be a collection. The, what, what, if you pass it a collection, what will happen here is the item view will treat that model as a single item. It will only render it as, as if it is a single item. You don't have to pass it a backbone model, you could pass it whatever you want. So here I've defined a new Marionette item view, and I've given it a template. That's it. I've then created the view, given it a model, and said render. That's the sum total of code that I need to render a view using Marionette. So the collection view, similar story, except it renders a collection. And the way it does that is you define an item view template. You say for every item in the collection that I'm going to give you, I want you to use this item template to render each item out. So I'm going to create a new collection view, give it a collection of stuff, and say render. And what, it, what will happen there is it will loop through each item in the collection of stuff, and it will use the item view template to render that particular item. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about is the layout. So this guy is quite cool. He's, just, he's a way of managing nested child views from within a parent view. And this is something that you try and achieve in uh, Backbone pretty of, uh, fairly often. So what you're doing here is we're defining a Marionette layout 
we're giving it a template, and then we're defining a set of regions that exist on that template. So the menu selector and the content selector need to exist inside that uh, layout template that I've defined above. And then you can use it by saying, okay, create a new layout and render it so that those elements exist in the DOM. And then you can say, hey, layout, in the menu region, if you could just show me the, the menu view, that would be cool. And in the content region, I want you to show me a main content view. Done. So the gain that Marionette is giving us here is that we've significantly reduced the amount of boilerplate code that we need to use uh, that we normally have to write when we're rendering views. So I've taken a bit of a focus on some of the rendering boilerplate code that Marionette reduces, but I'd like to mention that it also does a pretty good job at uh, reducing the complexity of managing uh, memory. So these are things like when our views are haven't been, uh, just our, our events haven't been uh, unbound when the views have been removed and we get ghost views. We get views that aren't, aren't on the screen responding to events when they shouldn't be. So when you close a view in Marionette, remove it from the DOM, what it's going to do is it's going to unbind any events that you've bound up using the listen to syntax, any custom view events or any DOM view, DOM view events. So the second thing that Marionette gives you is a set of extensions to help you build up this composite event-driven architecture that we've been talking about. So the main components that we've been discussing of a composite event-driven architecture is an mediated eventing system, a unifying application object which is responsible for the composition of our third component, modules. So I'm going to take a look at eventing. Now, eventing's an interesting one in Marionette. It used to have all of its eventing stuff built into its own project, but very recently it's been moved out into a project called Backbone Wrecker, which you can use in total isolation. So Marionette depends on, on Backbone Wrecker. So Wrecker has uh, three things. It has an implementation of an event aggregator, the pub sub, and it also has, interestingly, uh, an implementation of request response messaging and command messaging. So let's take a look at how uh, Backbone Wrecker deals with the event aggregator. So the event aggregator is a way for you to have a mediated publish and subscribe mechanism. So in Marionette, you can have as many of these as you want. And I encourage you to have a few of them. So the, the key here is that, Mar uh, is that the ends of the publish and subscribe, they don't necessarily know about each other. You can just publish into the oblivion and whoever's subscribed to hear about that event will have their callback raised. So here I'm creating a new Rekka event aggregator. Somewhere in my app, using the on function, I am registering my interest in an event foo. And then somewhere else in my application, I'm able to trigger that event, causing the callback uh, console log foo event to be run. Requests. So the idea here is that you can request uh, something, something to be returned to you using a request response messaging pattern. So you can create a new uh, backbone record request response. You can say, I'll handle this foo event, this foo request. And then somewhere else in your app at a later time, you can say, hey, I request foo. You don't care who you request it from, anybody can give it to you, but I request foo, and you will have foo requested, this is the response returned to you. Commands. Okay, so we're creating, it's very similar to uh, the request response. So we're creating a new record command. We're setting a handler. We're saying, I will respond to this command. And then somewhere else, later, at a different point in your app, you're able to execute the command foo, and you'll know that something will happen. Something, somebody will deal with that command. So the difference here between the request and the response and the command is that the command is not returning anything. There's nothing... There's nothing to return, just do something. Don't tell me about it, just do it. So all of this is actually built on top of backbone events. There's nothing that you could, couldn't sit down and build yourself. Um, the gain that you're getting here from using something like this is you're adding semantic meaning to the events that you're raising. And that's a really important point. So instead of raising an event and two weeks later coming back and looking at your code and going, I have no idea what I was trying to achieve here, you can say, oh, I'm requesting that I get something back. It's very explicit. 
you're cl clearly communicating your intent. Okay, so Marinette also has an application object, which is key to uh, composing your application. So remember this guy? So I'm going to show you the four, I'm going to show you how Marinette deals with the four key ingredients of a composite event-driven architecture and how this comes to play within Marinette. So previously I mentioned some of the responsibilities of the application object. We have the startup, mediated eventing, managing the life cycle of our modules, and the placement of its views. So in Marinette, startup's pretty simple. You create a new application and you call start. You get a few events that you can hook into. So there's three. There's on initialize before, on initialize after, and on start, which are, run at, at very, are called at various points of the application start. So this is your opportunity to fire up your engines, to do any bootstrapping that you need. Here I'm starting up the history API. Eventing. So we talked about Backbone Wrecker and the event aggregator in Backbone Wrecker. So by default, every Marionette application gets one event aggregator. So you can add as many of these as you want on top of that, but you're going to get one for free. So you use it just the same way as you use the, the Wrecker uh, event aggregator object. Using the on uh, function, you say, I'm interested in foo events, and I'll run this when you call me. And then somewhere else later in your application, you're able to raise the event, trigger the event foo. Managing the life cycle of your modules. So it's the application's job to compose a module's behavior. It's also the application's job to decide when a module should start. So just imagine, for argument's sake, that foo module is a module that hangs off application. It's as simple as when it's appropriate for you to start a module, you just call start. And the start, when starts run right inside the module, there's a lot of uh, the similar uh, initializers that get run, so those events that you can hook into to do, to do any, uh, I guess, startup tasks that your module needs to perform when start's called. And the last thing is placement. So I talked about the layout view uh, earlier, which was a way to specify regions and manage child views inside a parent view. So our application object has a very similar uh, functionality. You can use uh, the add regions function and you, you can define a set of regions that exist within your application. So here I've got a navigation, a content, sidebar, and a footer. So these are the common ways that you might structure your web, web application. Then once my application start, started, I'm able to say, hey, application, in the content view, I need you to put this new view. Just display that. And it will call, the rend it will call render on the view, and it will display it in that area. And the last thing that Marionette needs to take care of is modules. So in Marionette, uh, modules, they hang off this application object. Because the application object is really just a special kind of module, which is uh, more geared towards managing uh, all of the things that it needs to manage in order to achieve a composite design. So here we've defined a Marionette module. We've called the module function on the application object. We've given our module a name and a function. We might want to put all of our uh, views, models, all sorts of things in here. This is where they need to be neatly contained. You can also add any of those request uh, command handlers that we were talking about with, within Backbone Wrecker here. So for example, you might have an image catalog uh, module, and it will respond to commands to add an image to the catalog, or it will respond to a request to get the contents of the catalog. So we've said goodbye to all of our crappy plumbing code using Marionette. We no longer have to worry about uh, rendering boilerplate code or managing unbinding of events. It's all done for you. We've added semantic meaning to our events by using Backbone Wrecker, using words like command, request response, and the event aggregator. And now we can be confident that our application is built in a way that will readily accept change. We only have to make a small change to one part in order to achieve something. We've unsucked our backbone using Marionette JS. So I feel like I've only scratched the surface of what Marionette can do. It provides a huge head start when implementing these patterns in JavaScript. And the other thing that I really like about it is that it's a bit of a treasure trove of very useful patterns. You can go onto GitHub, read the source code, and start to learn some interesting things. The other thing that's really good about it is that if you don't want to use all of it, 
it's written in a way that's quite modular. So you can start to just use one thing. You might want to use the item view, for instance, to start off with. And then as you go, you might say, oh, well, this, this other object, this other function that Marionette has, that's interesting to me. And you can start bringing them in slowly and over time. So it's extremely well documented. It's actively taking contributions. So between the guy who uh, leads this project, Derek Bailey, and, and Annie Osmani, you've got these concepts covered. So if it was all too long and you didn't read it, Backbone is awesome, and scaling it is ridiculously hard. MVStar patterns, they help us create structure, but they don't tell us anything about how to structure our application beyond a presentation pattern. So we need to start thinking beyond MVStar. We need to start thinking about how we're going to compose our application from smaller parts to make a larger one. How we're going to manage complex behaviors through a mediated eventing system, control our modules life cycles, compose our UI. All of this will help us achieve a scalable design that will readily accept change. So make your application dance. Put it on a marionette. That's it. I know you're all probably quite hungry, but does anyone have any questions? Oh, yep. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So what I tend to do is if I have something that I want to reuse, so I guess the catalog is a good example, right? So I've got a catalog of stuff, and it's storing state about that catalog of stuff. And it might have internally to itself a way to represent those models. So it might need certain properties to keep track of you know, what's going on inside that catalog. But then the different views and other modules that are floating around there that might use images, they might not necessarily need to display all of those properties. They might not be relevant. So it really depends on the level of, of relevance, I guess. You can create a module that uh, exposes views if you, if you wanted to, and I think it's okay to create a, a common place where you've got a, one set of mod models that you've defined and all of them use. I, I'm, it, it depends how you use it, really. It depends how far you go with that concept. But I think the key is to think about, do all of your modules and all of your views really need that exact representation of that model? Is, is that appropriate? So it's just finding the level of appropriateness. There's no silver bullets. Depends. I think I think uh, I think using something like MVC, uh, Microsoft MVC, ASP.NET MVC. I think that still plays a part. Uh, but I think if you're trying to build rich applications, it depends how rich. But there comes a point where uh, you've got so much going on on the client side that introducing some level of structure is really important. So I don't think one replaces the other. I think they can work together. Anything else? So, so Backbone has a way of syncing your models back to the server. So if you've got a REST API uh, just using standard HTTP verbs, you can update the state, up, uh, yeah, get, get the state, delete objects, create objects, all of those kinds of things. So you basically, with a Backbone model, you give it a URL, and then using those verbs, you can start manipulating the state on the server. Yes. I think if you were looking to solve SEO problems, you probably want to do that in a subtly different way. I, I'm not sure that uh, this is going to help you there. I think, I think you might be fighting it a little bit. You probably want to look at doing your SEO in a subtly different way, so delivering that when the page initially loads. Uh, 
Uh, yes, yeah, so when you start an, your application, you can, it can take in configuration. So at that point, you can, you can pass in uh, any state that you want to pass into the application for it to use. So that would be how you would, would achieve that. You would pass it in initially at the beginning. Oh, time for one more question. Uh, well, I think the answer to that is that you should probably start small. So you should probably start with the, with the item views and the collection views and start getting gain from reducing some of the boilerplate code, getting rid of all of those ugly render methods and managing events. And then slowly over time, you'll start to see opportunities to start bringing in some of the more complex uh, objects that it has. Cool, okay.